uh, anyway, everybody, this is Garrett Stanley. He's going to be our presenter and speaker for tonight, and he has his own background in there. So all I have to do is say, hey, everybody, this is Garrett, and tonight's topic is sales due diligence, sales and marketing. Take it away, Garrett. Cool. Thanks, Maggie. All right. So um, the gold nugget for anybody wanting that early on is sales is all about building trust. And we'll get into that in just a second. So I'll share my screen. Okay. Yeah, we do. Perfect. And Josh right. made it. Hey, Josh. Good evening. All Wouldn't right. miss it for the world. I'm looking forward to this all week. <laughs> well, you missed the gold nugget, but I'll repeat it for you. Sales is about building trust. So, all right. So I'm Garrett. Um Quick little intro to sales for founders. Um, quick background about me. So previous roles, been sales, operations, and finance industries, financial services and products, cybersecurity, and healthcare. Um, and then I've done this for both service-based businesses and SaaS. Um, cool thing about sales is it's it translates pretty equally to just about whatever delivery method you have. Um, all right, so the objective here is to talk about due diligence and sales, um, but instead of just saying, hey, this is what I wanna see or what I don't wanna see or what I typically see others want or don't wanna see, um, I wanted to start with the general explanation of how sales works how to think about it, um, and then how to actually go about evaluating your business um, from a sales standpoint, so that when you look at the due diligence questionnaire, you have some roots into what we're trying to get at. Um, please, if there's any questions or comments, whatever, jump in. Um, so... Two-way is really cool. All right, table of contents, and everybody can have this afterwards. So what is sales, customer relationships, your sales evolution? Um, you know, what is the anatomy of sales? You know, hard numbers, must-haves, red flags, resources. Um, so starting with three quotes, the first is, if you have a problem, make a friend. Um, this is super important to me because it's something we often forget, especially in sales. You, If you have a problem, you go to your friends. And so naturally, since sales is all about solving a sales problem, make a friend, right? View your potential customers as people you want to get to know. Um, also, when you're going through all of this, reach out to your community, make friends. Um, second, this is just kind of a, a fun quip. So we've all heard about friendships that get blown up because of starting businesses together. Um, the opposite is really true where people won't, you know, they, they come in as strangers, they do business together, and then they become lifelong friends. That's actually a fairly common thread. Um, so whatever that's worth. And then last but not least, if they tell you that there are no friends in business, be careful. Um, we all know about used car salesmen and there's that typical notion around that. So sales gets a bad rap, but if sales is done properly, you actually are building a network of people that you can reach out to later, years later, you know, multiple companies later, um, and you actually have a, a, a sort of support group and network you can, you can do other business with. So, um, yeah, common thread here is it's all about trust. All right. What is sales? So first off, what is it not? It's not trying to convince someone to buy your product, um, regardless of how desperately you might want the sale. Um, there's the famous, I forget the movie, but always be closing. Um, that's the biggest load of BS because it more often than not blows up in your face. Um, so what is sales? It is about building relationships. Um, the type of relationship you are looking for determines how you have to build it. 
So if I want to get married, I need to have a very deep relationship and that takes a lot of time. There are always exceptions to every rule. Um, but if I just want a drinking buddy, right, I can walk up to any bar and within a few minutes, I can probably have a decent drinking buddy. Um, so we'll talk about that later. Uh, sales is the silent killer. There are tons and tons and tons of great products and great businesses that have failed because they hadn't figured out how to build a sales relationship. Um, and there are tons of companies that provide absolute garbage work that make tons of money because they know how to sell. So at the end of the day, sales is this bottom paragraph. It's helping your customer understand for themselves and then actually convince themselves that you are the best fit for them. It's not you actively trying to convince them. All right, so relationships. Um, what kind of relationship are you asking for, right? We talked about this a second ago, but from a business standpoint, if I'm buying a candy bar, there isn't really much of a relationship. It's an impulse buy. It may or may not be the same for a hundred dollar game, right? If I've got a widget, that's a hundred bucks one time, depending on who your audience is, it may take some time. It may be quick. If it's a marriage or a three-year commitment, it's going to take a lot more time. So your type of relationship dictates your sales cycle and how you need to plan for that. So I'm going through the process of training a sales team right now. And this plot twist here actually helped them kind of get it. You're not selling yourself. You are selling the business. Um, and the best way to think about that is parents and kids. So parents want their kids to be liked and parents want their kids to interact with children that they like and with children who have parents that are likable. So business is the same thing. Your business is your child. Your customer's business is their child. And you want to think about how that interaction relates, right? And so you want your child respectable, so you don't want to be pushy, right? Um, and you want the other child's parents to want their business or their child to play with your child. Um, so, um, all right, how many relationships do you need? This is a big deal. So people think about selling is that you just need to go get five sales or 10 sales or 20 sales a month or a quarter or whatever you need. Um, and that often leads to a lot of work that is largely unproductive. So how do I know this? My first sales job after closing uh, my first startup was in selling life insurance that everybody loves, right? So I got into this by knocking on tons of doors, making tons of phone calls. And naturally, when you say, hey, I'm Garrett, I want to, you know, would you like some life insurance? You get a lot of doors slammed in your face and you learn pretty quickly that the product doesn't always sell itself. And just because there might actually be a genuine need, it doesn't always become apparent. So how do you work through this is it actually is about relationships. So determining the type of relationship you need to build to sell your product, again, has to be compensated in the financial forecast. So we'll talk about this in a second, but you go from within three months, we're going to have no relationships to a hundred relationships. We're going to add a hundred a month, but the relationships need to take a lot of time, think life insurance or a three-year agreement, things like that, um, you're going to have a whole lot of resistance. Um, part of that also then means is who do you hire and how do you structure cultivating these relationships? Do you need, um, you know, a, a 
the term here is lone wolf, right? Or you, do you need a bunch of people who are just going to go knock on doors or hit the phones um, who can be very independent? Or is this an enterprise type relationship that requires a sort of a team that have different specialties, onboarding, project management, um, maybe some negotiating expertise that actually need to be brought in to, to facilitate the deal? Um, or do you need to have a partnership to actually help facilitate these relationships, referrals, et cetera? All right. Um, level of effort. So we talked about this a second ago, um, but everything comes down to cost. Um, relationships cost money and they cost time, right? Dating is money and time. Marriage is money and time. A business is no different and customers are no different. And just because you may say, hey, well, I now have a customer. Maintaining that customer actually does that is still sales. So the cost of time and money to maintain that customer relationship, you have to think about also. And that's an actual cost that I want at least evaluated. Um, and point three, spending money does not always equal success. So sometimes it's, well, we need to hire people just to cultivate some sense of a relationship with our stakeholders, et cetera. All right, sales evolution. Um, so just like dating, right? You have to learn the game and then you kind of get your, your tool belt. So you have a set of assumptions of what people like to talk about. You go try to have a conversation. You realize that, well, who you're talking to may not be into Pokemon or something. And then you have to figure out what to do next. Um, and then eventually you have a system, right? So you know where to go. If you're trying to look for a date, you know how to have a conversation um, and ask for a second date, et cetera. It's no different with sales. So you start with where you are, your assumptions, just like dating. It sucked probably at first for most people. Um, trying to figure out how to talk to another person, um, learn to actually gain their interest. Um, and then you keep repeating that cycle. Sales is the same thing. Once you, so you are, as a startup, you are trying to figure out what works. And so spending tons and tons of time creating these big plans largely is pointless because you actually have to figure out what works. So what we want to see is how do you capture the set of experiments in your sales plan? And so you can inform your process and then actually you, you get a handful of assumptions and activity and now you have a system. Um, so you go from pre-revenue to hopefully having some people help you with your first set of assumptions, to getting your first set of customers. These experiments start to pay off. You have some sort of a process. And then when you're actually truly post-revenue um, and you're outside of that immediately friend, immediate friends and family revenue source, you become process-driven. Um, but just because you once you get there, you still have to always evolve and learn. So that's the general sales evolution. Um, Pre-revenue talked about this a little bit, but at minimum, you need to have a group of potential customers who are informing what you are doing, right? So if you're building something without a clear endpoint in mind, preferably from someone who is a potential customer, um, you have a problem. Um, oftentimes these people, whether they're, whether you develop an actual partnership where you're going to give them some crazy deal for being the first customer or they're on an advisory board or it's an informal relationship, their advice, their input is what helps you develop 
what they want. And so therefore they oftentimes become customers, your first set of customers. Um, and if you do this well, you may actually find that they will become investors in your um, business in addition to just being a customer. I've seen that repeatedly. Um, we actually have a portfolio company that got an investment from Intuit. And after an extra five years of building the product, they actually, Intuit just bought the company. So the point is, um, just like with this general sales process, trust and everything else in the set that makes the sale viable happens on the front end, which is why always be closing is pointless. Um, all right, post-revenue consistency is key and a process that you follow day in and day out, one that's actually written um, is the only real key to success. So without a process, that you have, and I'm, I mean, seriously, like a standard operating procedure where, you know, if a lead comes in, I do this, if there's an exception, we'll handle it. But what does the process look like? Um, it's the reason pilots always use checklists. They don't forget anything. They know how to handle something that doesn't fit in the checklist. Sales is the same way. Once you develop your system, you now have this process that allows you to offload the mental drain of actually running sales, working with your customers and your audience. And then as you're then focused on them and learning from them, and then every quarter, or every month, you update your process as necessary. All right, so let's get into what actually makes a sale. Um, sales and marketing are not the same thing, but they are very closely integrated. So we're going to go through both. Um, but at the basic level, you start at the bottom to get a new customer. You have to establish trust in order to establish trust. You have to build presence in order to build presence. <laughs> you need people to know you exist. So we'll work through that. So let's start with trust. Um, the definition of trust is confidence in something and belief in someone. So I trust my dog not to chew the furniture, et cetera. Um, but what does that mean from an operational standpoint? So it means I have confidence that an individual or a business or another organization is going to act in a specific way. Right. So there's lots of examples, um, some fun ones, right? I can trust that Elon Musk doesn't matter if you like the person or not. I have confidence that he will tweet about whatever is on his mind. Right. I have confidence that Josh, as a poker player, is going to pick up on behavioral patterns so that it can inform his decision making process. Right. It's all about confidence in a particular outcome. And that's actually how people buy, right? So whether you, doesn't matter what kind of car you like, but there's a reason why customer, why Toyota and Lexus have, they're the biggest, I think, auto manufacturers on the planet is because people have confidence that they are going to, their car is going to behave a certain way. It's going to be reliable and the customer service is going to be outstanding. And it's, it needs to be the same thing for your business. That also means that you have to target a very specific person. You can't be everything to everyone. So if you think about politics for a second, because it's always a sales process, right? If I'm campaigning to bring the oil and gas back into boom, well, people are going to trust that that's what I stand for or that's what I'm selling, right? But by its natural progression, if you're in solar, you're going to be skeptical about me 
but you are going to trust that when you meet me that I'm going to be interested in gas. So my point is you end up splitting your set of groupies out of the general population. And that's what you actually want. So the best example here um, is Taylor Swift. Anytime she gets brought up in any conversation, you have the people who love her and you have the people who hate her. But that's the point. The people who love her are all she actually needs. And honestly, there isn't the same gravity without people who don't like her. Um, so there's we can have a totally separate conversation around this. But the point is you have to establish trust with a very specific group of people. Um, so that way, no matter what, they have confidence that you are able to deliver for their very specific situation and what they need. All right. So anatomy of sales. Um, this is, I'm sorry, for awareness, right? That is marketing. Um, this is the most misunderstood piece and it's the fastest way to blow through a ton of cash. The ultimate goal here is to make people aware that you exist. Your goal isn't to do anything else. Um, it's also really easy to spend a lot of money because it's fun and the rest of the sales process is largely not fun. Um, or at least for most people, it's not very fun. So the goal be omnipresent, but it's where your groupies are. So the process for that is as follows. Um, the, it starts with getting in front of them, right? Then do they have any interest? So spark their interest so that it keeps in front of them, right? And then nurture them. You're continually sparking their interest with something. And then eventually you capture their interest, which brings you into the sales funnel. So an example here is... Um, you may have an ad, a click ad, you may just have a newsletter, right? The awareness, once once something pops up and grabs my attention, I now know that you exist. That's great, but that's fleeting. So you have to do something to capture the initial interest, spark that interest. So that's where you have lead generation um, for newsletters, um, opt in, you know, capture some kind of information with something of interest to your potential customer. So that way you can keep feeding them other bits of interest, right? So that's how we move into that presence zone. You are building some gravity in their mind, or as I like to call it, it's a web of positive interactions. Um, you see this a lot with, I mean, fill in the blank. Is it Zapier, ClickUp, I looked for, um, what was it, the best email clients for a Mac. And Zapier and ClickUp, both of which don't do anything with email from an email client standpoint, they both popped up at the top of Google. And it was, this is why, you know, these are the best ones and our recommendations for each. But the reason that's important is they do that for tons of things that touch tech and it's because you always are going to their website. And so when you actually have a need, they can capture your interest because you are, they've built up that presence in your mind. Um, so once you have the interest and someone actually has that need for your product or your service, um, you drip into the top of the sales funnel. So the general steps are you have to, help them figure out at a very high level if whoops if your solution meets their need then you have to help them compare your product to others right again we're not trying to say hey i'm the best you want to help them figure it out for themselves um, negotiation then we really get into the meat of the matter to so iron out any details and then sign and then last but not least, you have to figure out how to keep their loyalty. Um, 
So a great customer success team and process. Is there some stickiness, right? Wells Fargo is known for this. A lot of people hate them, but they make it really difficult to leave once you're in their ecosystem. Um, you can read up on tons of companies and how they do this and then moat. All right, hard numbers. Um, at the end of the day, it's a sale, it's a numbers game. So there's a guy who sold insurance. Um, he was the first person to make a million dollars in personal income year over year by selling life insurance. His name's Al Granham. I think he's he's hasn't been around for a while. Um, but if you go work in any insurance related field, they this is the first thing that they talk to you about. 1031. For every 10 qualified leads, you can get three viable prospects and you get one customer. Now, there are some asterisks here. A qualified lead is not somebody that you just met at a bar or at some networking event. They, You have to know who they are. They have to know what you do. They have to actually have interest in what you do. So they need to see value in what you're doing and they need the ability to buy. So that's why it's called a qualified lead and not just a lead. Once you have that, then statistically over the next six months, you will get a customer. Um, so the question is, if this we talked about in the top of the sales funnel, when you've piqued someone's interest and they want to talk, that's this 10 qualified lead piece. Then as you help them through your process, you get to viable prospects, you actually start to have demos, you work them through the process and you become a customer. All right. Um, so, um, and for the record, this 1031 holds across the majority of industries, um, but there are some things you can do to improve this. Um, I think we talk about it later, but within your space, if you get really good at learning from your customer, you can actually improve the numbers. All right. Eric, question? Yes. Uh, can you go back one slide? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, before you get to the state of, of qualified leads, is there any other hard number kind of metrics or um, ways of thinking about, well, how much, you know, I guess it's going to be sector dependent, but how many people or interactions does it take to get to 10 qualified leads? Can you kind of extrapolate out even further? Yes and no. Um, you have to really know your customer is the main thing, right? So if I, if, all right, so I'll, I'll kind of use me as an example. So um, if I am trying to, all right, so a portfolio company does electronic medical records basically for um, Medicaid waiver services. It's a very specific industry. The, there are a, we can send spam into the ether and we can talk to all these people who work in these industries. But at the end of the day, um, our total lead pool are the owners of individual agencies or nonprofits who actually take care of um, individuals th with disabilities that qualify for Medicaid. So I say this because there's only a handful. And if I actually go to an industry event where I may be around 100 or 200 or 300 of them, I actually can probably bypass this 10 and get directly to the prospects. Um, or I may be able, you know, I'm not going to track the number of anything above that because I'm going directly to where I can find a qualified lead. If I don't have that um, and I'm trying to sell auto insurance, then you may, you know, so in that industry, it was easily 10x, 5 to 10x. So for every 5 to 10 random individuals we may interact with, we may get a qualified lead who may be interested. Um, so it, it really depends on how you're approaching your market and how well you know them and how effectively you can get in front of them. 
So I hope that helps a little bit. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. All right. Um, so healthy pipeline, uh, this is tough. Typically, if I need to make a million dollars by the end of the year, I need to have $4 million in my pipeline. Um, so referring back to the last slide, remember the top of the pipe says that I've got the people who are at the top of my pipeline or my funnel are interested in what I'm selling. So if I need to sell a million dollars of that, I need to have $4 million worth of people who are interested in what I'm selling. The reason for the 4X as opposed to 3X is, remember there's that six month asterisk. So within six months, these people may buy um, and then you wanna pad that for issues. Um, so you don't want stagnant leads. If I have somebody in the pipeline and I look through it, they need to be worked. They need to be owned. They actually need to be touched on a regular basis. If any, if somebody is not being worked, then your pipeline actually isn't healthy. Um, and you don't actually know what you have. So proper notation of your conversations. So we always operated, if it's not written down in the client or the, the opportunities um, notes, it didn't happen. Um, this, so most of my work has been in a highly regulated area and that's important for, you know, regulatory purposes, but also it's really important for you just helping your customer or your potential customer they're always bombarded. You're always bombarded. You need to have proper notes of what was discussed and pick up things that they may have said. Remember, your, your goal is to build a relationship. If they say, hey, well, my dog, it's my dog's birthday or, you know, I like elephants, notate it, right? There's lots of different ways that you can actually help influence a sale just by listening to what they have to say and you build rapport with them. And if you don't notate that, not only does that eventually work against you, it doesn't help your colleagues bond with them once they move past the sale and they're down into the, the customer service or customer success part of the business. Um, also, a healthy pipeline, for every account, there's an owner. And that is the person who is responsible for working that lead or that potential future customer through your entire process. All right. So slightly mentioned this earlier. How do you influence your numbers? Ask questions, right? There's a great book um, called uh, Never Split the Difference. Uh, and it's all about asking questions. How questions? What questions? How does this work for you? How can we make this work? How could this help your company? What do you like about this? What might this do for your bottom line or for your team members, right? How and what questions get objective information out of the people you're interacting with? Um, and that is, those are the ingredients for you actually um, improving your sales process and building a relationship. Um, learning and training. So, there's tons and tons of books and seminars and all these things. Um, highly recommend that you are always reading and just looking at it. YouTube videos, um, HubSpot has tons and tons of resources. Um, so by you'll you'll pick up these little gold nuggets and they can really help. And then you'll learn when different ones are helpful and which ones are not. Adjust your messaging. Once someone becomes a customer. It is important to always ask them what helped push them over the finish line. What were things they liked? What were things they didn't like? More important, ask the people who didn't buy, right? Say, hey, you know, wait a few months later. Hey, I, you know, this isn't a sales thing. Thanks for taking the time. I just wanted to know, like, out of curiosity, what drove you in the other direction? You're going to learn a lot more from those than the people who became your customers. Um, best part is after six months or a year or whenever their purchase cycle may be, they may actually come back to you because you asked. A lot of people 
once you say no, you're, you know, you're just set off and they forget about them. Um, so by actually asking people who chose to work with somebody else can help build your pipeline and your relationships in the future. Um, number four is an interesting one. Um, a lot of people like to find shortcuts um, and salespeople are no different. Distribution centers are great. Um, centers of influence are great um, and they can be super helpful once you actually have a process and you know what you're doing. Asking for help is great, but once you actually have done the hard work, you've done the things that can't scale, right? Like driving out and going, waiting in the lobby for potential big customers, for example. Once you've done this and you've built up a foundation of relationships and revenue, you now have a system. Now you can actually recruit help to help improve your numbers and do some of the work. Um, but that does not replace you doing the hard work in the beginning. All right. This is just a quick example. Um, one of my earlier positions was running a sales team for State Farm. And 65 calls a day is close to impossible. If no one answers, you can do it in three hours. If, and we're talking about just smiling, dialing really hard. If everybody answers, you might get through 25 a day. The people who became extremely successful, whoops. All right, sorry about that. The people who became really successful managed to do an average of 110 calls a day. So it's just less than double the work, but it had a, on average about a 3x impact on their bottom line and their top line. So when we did that, we added, we were adding about $50,000 in MRR a month and we had four people, right? So it means working outside of the nine to five. And what you actually will find is within eight to five, nine to five, people are busy get up early, start making phone calls and sending emails, you know, 5, 6 a.m. And do that until 5, 6, 7 p.m. And decision makers are actually oftentimes open during those times because the gatekeeper is not there or they may actually have a little free time sitting at a red light or something. Um, but it still comes down to numbers. And then ultimately that cash flow up in the beginning from them the owner or whoever it is grinding for those 110 calls, they were able to free up some cash to actually bring on sales help. And so as a startup, that's a really important thing to keep in mind is structuring it so that you can eke out that little extra bit of effort um, and get through the trough of your sales experience. All right. Um, Nitty gritty. So must haves. So these are, things that I want to see um, VCs and angels typically want to see um, and issues that we've run into. So clear proof that you can legally sell your product. That's a big one. A lot of people miss it, but you, you know, if you can't, or it's a gray area, you need to talk about it, disclose it because otherwise it's a torpedo, but clear pr proof, you can legally sell your product. Um, a detailed competitor analysis. I want to know who your competitors are. And if you say you don't have any, you're full of crap. Um, so who are they? What makes them valuable? How does that compare to yourself? Um, in sales, you call those battle cards. So when someone says, oh, well, I'm, if I'm selling monday.com and someone says, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm looking at ClickUp. Say, so, okay, great here's my comparison. And I know how to talk to that person about what's good and what's bad. I want to see a competitor pricing benchmark and what justifies that benchmark, right? Portfolio company thought that they could get away with charging three to four times the their competitors. Um, it didn't work out so well. They have since revived and now they're actually charging uh, twice as much and it's working really well. But they started with what they thought was great, but when they actually went through and looked at the value proposition from the customer standpoint against the benchmarking anchors, 
they realized that they needed to adjust that. So do that up front. It's always easier to raise your price than it is to lower it and try to win business that you lost. Um, so explicit assumptions for your sales operations, right? We talked about the amount of effort that it goes into actually building your relationships. So if you have to make a hundred sales a month, you're one guy who's running everything. Your average sale requires you to have three, you know, back to 10, three, one, you need to do 300 demos a month. That's probably not grounded in reality. So think through that. Um, five and six matter a little bit more for post-revenue, but what are your sales KPIs? So do you need calls made? Do you need to have people visiting your website? You know, what are they? And then what are the activities that keep them up above the threshold so that you're actually making the sales? Same thing for marketing. This is really important. Most people, most of the time, marketing actually doesn't need to be expensive. Um, you know, I know of a few companies who are doing several million a year who literally spend $50 a month on MailChimp. And that is their outside of a salesperson who writes some marketing material. That's their only outbound marketing stuff. So again, how know your customer. Um, and then figure out how to track what is effective for your marketing dollars. All right, pre-revenue. I have a tendency to look at sales. And so for me, a must have is someone on your team with sales experience. If you don't have that, you need to compensate for it. And outsourcing your sales is not a viable option. Um, so how do you acquire it? Are you going to work, rely on your network um, or, you know, the incubator or somebody to help you have some substance around that? Um, I actually like to see a drawn out business model. People forget the glue that holds these pieces together. Um, and so do you need to rely on um, a distribution process that you don't control, right? If you're in the electronic medical record space, um, that may be a governmental relationship instead of just with a hospital, for example. So draw it out and then you can trace the dollars and how they flow through it. And that's going to influence your sales process. Um, so proof that you understand your sales and revenue expectations. And right? we kind of hit on that already. Um, but this goes down to runway. If you say, hey, I've got six months in the bank and by the end of six months, we're going to be you know, we're going to cut our burn rate by three fourths and we're going to have a whole bunch of customers. Unless you can really substantiate that, um, that's pie in the sky. So be able to lay that out. Um, so that bleeds into number four. Number five, challenge your sales assumptions, right? It's, it's really simple. Just like you're going to try to steel man everything, straw man it too. Um, and then number six, this is um, this the MD two hundred comes from uh, actually an insurance thing years ago, before you had all these fancy tools. You were given an Excel sheet that said fill out two hundred potential customers of people that you know, friends and family. Um, the same concept applies here. In pre revenue, start identifying people that you can go after. It's super easy to burn through your immediate references. So start planning early. It doesn't mean you have to have a great system for tackling them, but start to identify who these people might be. So when you need to start selling, you actually have an idea. Um, and that also helps if you need some additional validation for product development. Post-revenue, um, written sales process. If it's not written, you're not doing it. Um, same thing with KPIs. If they're not written, they're not being tracked, it's not getting done. So named opportunities and deals, this is a big deal. If you don't know, if, if I ask you, hey, tell me about you know, Maggie's company and you can't tell me who the decision maker is, it's not a real opportunity. It's just not. 
So that may be a lead, but that is still in the marketing end of the awareness funnel. That's not actually in your pipeline. Um, true CRM management. I don't care if it's an Excel sheet. I want to see the individuals, their potential es estimated revenue, um, who you're talking to and notes and when you're going to talk to them next, when was the last time you talked to them? When, what did you talk about? Right. That is true customer relationship management. And if that's not being done, you're, you have very slim chance of actually making it with a sales team. Um, designated revenue person, doesn't matter if it's a CEO, CFO, someone who is responsible for making sure this gets done. Um, all right, red flags. So the naughty list, right? You can't sell your product. That's bad. Um, no deals list. If you don't know who you're selling to, you don't have a list of potential people you can sell to. Um, it's still pie in the sky. You have no idea. Um, a stagnant deals list. We talked about this. That's bad. Outsourcing sales is unacceptable, generally speaking. Um, if you are having challenges, which is fine, that's expected. Um, they can't be a company with excuses. Um, all right. Missing someone with sales experience. It's hard to work through any of these things. If you don't have someone who's actually kind of cut their teeth and made a living with sales for a while, um, because getting hit in the nose with sales is tough. So having somebody who has some experience with working through that is really, really helpful. And they at least have some bearings on how to get better. Um, number seven is a big one for me. So I live by my calendar. If you ask me on any day what I'm doing, I've already got it likely in the calendar. So if I ask you what you have to work on in a sales domain or any other domain and you're like well i think then you actually don't know um and that's a huge red flag for me um and we've gone through the others all right resources um your startup community um i'm going to share a marketing funnel template it was designed for um actually financial people um investment managers but who are trying to go independent, but it's still a great resource for illustrating all of this. Um, HubSpot is fantastic. Give them your name, your phone number, and your email. And I think they've got like 30 or 40 templates worth of stuff. Plus they're a free CRM if you with some restrictions. Use it. It's free. They have some others that are probably free too. Um, and HubSpot will try to upsell you, but the templates are actually pretty good. So at least you can learn from them. Um, the Challenger Sale is a book that is talking about educating your customer and how to have them work themselves through your process by taking the educational approach as opposed to the hard, you know, 10x by sell, sell, sell. Um, and then one dropped off. So I don't know what's up with that. Um, that's me. Phone number, email, call me if you have any questions. Happy to be a resource. And then otherwise, thank you. Thank you, Garrett. Right. Great job. Great thank work. Thank you. Thanks, Garrett. So thank you. Um, so I missed a couple questions or something popped up, I think, for the chat. Oh, I, I added into the chat the answer to the movie that you couldn't remember, always be closing. Oh. Um, also. <laughs> um a book that was written by a startup guy for startup people, founding sales. Cool. So it talks about how the founder has to be responsible for the first sales. It's his job. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I definitely agree. So on that, so the last cybersecurity company I worked with was a, it was really fantastic in a lot of weird ways, but the founder was 28 or 29 he was doing 7 million in renewable or and you know ARR um they had an eight person team and his biggest challenge was when he got he was 
the reason for all of their sales, which was great. But then he got super invested and it was hard for him to actually then work on the business. But that's a great problem to have, right? So, but yeah, so to your point, he drove the sales and that's really the position all founders are in is you got to do it. Um, all right. We have what? 10 minutes left. What's, is that right? Yeah. You have about 10 minutes left, maybe a little bit more. Uh, do you want to, okay. do you want to just take questions or do you want to go over the actual due diligence questionnaire? So I'm happy to do either. Um, you know, what I, I can also do is the due diligence questionnaire. Um, I, I wrote some stuff in there. If, Josh or anybody wants to proof it. Otherwise, I can send it out. I'm happy to make the comments available if that's appropriate or that's allowed. Oh, um, that's cool. Yeah, we'll include that. Um, we send an email out with the link to this video okay. and, and your deck if you want to share it. And sure. if you have uh, a filled out DD questionnaire, we can link that as well. Okay. So yeah. just send it back to me. Okay, cool. I'll I'll proof it since I was just, you know, brain dumping but okay yeah, that, that'd be <laughs> fine i uh yeah i even talked about my first little thing that failed because we didn't realize we couldn't sell what we were trying to sell um, did you do discuss a customer discovery before you started trying to sell what you were trying to sell we did actually and we had we almost took two million dollars um, we had a location we were building out. We had a whole lot of stuff going on. And then we had a meeting with the assistant district attorney who let us know that in New Orleans, there's what we were doing wasn't illegal, but because of three laws that were written, they triangulated this area and it said that we were not allowed to process. We were We were selling and delivering booze. Um, before it was hit with COVID. Um, and so we found out during this really odd discussion that the rule was you had to validate the identification of the purchaser at the point of sale, not the point of delivery. Oh. And so it was this weird little nuance that you don't think actually matters. Um but because of how the distribution system works, we weren't doing them right then. Um, so anyway, they changed the law for COVID, but you know. Did they change it back after? No, they didn't. Well, That's good. I don't know. There was some <laughs> speculation about that, but I don't think so. I think they made it to, so it was that bars and stuff could deliver, which is what we were doing. Um, we were actually importing craft beers and stuff from the east and west coast and we had a bar that was tapping them and making little growlers and delivering those and then pre-made cocktails and stuff um and so you could deliver with a bar license you couldn't deliver with any of the others and then during covid they changed it so that everybody could deliver and i didn't follow it closely after but i think they restricted it so now only grocery stores can deliver so, oh. yeah. Oh, well, live and learn. I was well, like 21. So, you know. So you can buy booze in grocery stores in Louisiana? In most places. So Louisiana is weird because it depends on your, we call them parishes. Parish, yeah. Depends on your county. Um, So they're called blue laws. I don't know why they're called blue laws, but um, certain parishes or counties are not allowed to sell um, spirits or liquor at all. Um, so you can't deliver in those areas either. But if you don't, if you're not in a blue law parish, then yes, you can go into your Albertsons or Walmart and right next to the bread is usually a big old liquor aisle. <laughs> so, yeah. Good old Louisiana. And grain liquor is legal there, which is, I've learned living other places is not legal in a lot of the country. So like Everclear. Like Moonshine? Um, 
It's like 99, <laughs> pretty much, but it's like 99% pure alcohol. I don't know why you'd want to drink it, but anyway. So are there any questions? Uh, yeah, I had a question. Okay. Hi, I'm Megan. <laughs> Megan. Uh, so do you, you had mentioned that you had uh, started some SaaS companies in the past. Do you have any recommendations for estimating um, the customer retention rates before sales, like before we start selling? Um, that's a great question. So yes and no, it kind of the generic flag was number of tickets and ticket aging. So if you've, the more customers you get, the, the more tickets you're naturally going to have to process. Um, but you start to develop your own kind of parameters around what is an acceptable number of tickets? How quickly are they getting closed um, satisfactorily? Um, and so that informs your retention. Um, and then we, in order to try to jump ahead of that, we started doing random customer surveys or incentivizing surveys, um, both blind and name surveys. So the blind surveys, naturally, um, we don't know any, you don't know who submitted the answers, um, but the surveys kind of helped us identify some problem, some pain points that weren't easily expressed like in a service ticket. Um, and then we started actually surveying people who left and that helped us. We were able to kind of triangulate out of the number of people who left, who answered a certain way, we were able to kind of figure out how many people may have not been expressing concerns. So I know that doesn't directly answer your question, um, but ticket volume. And then when you work through your initial handful of customers, you can usually triangulate some internal metrics for identifying customers at risk. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And I'm, I'm happy to try to connect you with, um, or do some research. Um, we're building that out right now for another company. Um, and so there's a big, um, um, uh, EMR Cerner corporation. So he was the director of their something with customer success. Um, and so he's working through that right now. So I'll actually bug him about it and, uh, I'll, I'll find some more information for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Let me you write your name down. Quick. Other questions? Come on, people. I know sales is so exciting. Sales is exciting. And sales is a great profession that gets a bad rap because of car salesmen and, you know, Len Gary. But people who are creating a product, you're a founder, right? And you are solving a problem. If you don't believe in your product, then why are you investing 20 hours of your day into it? There is no better person to be able to go out and say, I'm solving this problem for you. Tell me how I can solve more problems for you. Sales is, is great and it's, it's a great income. You just have to not think of yourself as, you know, selling your soul. You're helping people. I think that's really well put. Yeah. As, as a former salesperson, I, I'm deeply offended by the way, but uh... <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. Well, yeah, it definitely gets a bad rap and it, it can be, um, for people who haven't done it before, 
it is scary, right? But honestly, if you talk to the person that you're just meeting, like you would talk to an old friend, it makes it a lot easier because that's what you're trying to do is to be helpful and be friendly. Yeah. So come on, Josh, you got any questions? Uh, no questions. Um, right. I mean, to your point on, on sales and the importance, and if anyone's read zero to one, um, by Pierre Thiel, you know, very tech centric sort of guy and not the one you'd think would stand up and say that sales are one of the most important aspects and that so many companies, as you mentioned in the deck will die because they think they have, you know, a great product and that people will just come to them and sales really, like you said, is that, that killer thing that people can miss. So. Hey, Garrett. I did have... Oh, go ahead. Hey there. Oh, I'm sorry. Go right ahead, Garrett. I'll wait. Oh, yeah. All you. Go ahead, brother. No, you. I had interrupted. I'm sorry, Garrett. You're you you're about to chime in. Oh, no. This is like, a, like a, a cherry. Oh, sorry. Oh, I don't... I don't know. I don't think so. I don't know. I blab a lot, so... <laughs> <laughs> don't we all <laughs> now i was just going to say great great talk and, and just to kind of piggyback on uh, what, what josh was saying I, I had a question um in relation to um with us you know just the 800 pound gorilla in the room just your thoughts on it um how much do you think we as founders can rely to fill in those gaps that we're talking about from a sales standpoint using artificial intelligence in relation to funnels and kind of, you know, mining that gap for us until we can, you know, get some traction to actually maybe bring in, you know, more real folks, if you will. Like, what what do you see as far as guidance with, with founders using AI to fill those gaps in this great new world? Hmm. That's a good question. So, Garrett, you mentioned HubSpot. HubSpot mm -hmm. has several different podcasts and HubSpot is used primarily for marketing and not sales. The two things are different, mm -hmm. uh, but there is a podcast called Marketing Against the Grain. And uh, these two guys that are on there, there's one guy from Ireland. His name is Kip. No, it's Karen. Uh, whatever. It's Kip and Karen. <laughs> and this guy is such a geek and he geeks out so much on how you can use AI to create all of these tools for marketing. Sales is different, but Sal, if you wanted to go down a rabbit hole and have some fun with AI, you can do it with the help of marketing against the grain for marketing. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. cool. I didn't know that. Awesome. Maggie. Thanks, Maggie. Yeah. I have to check that out too. Um, I would say, Sal, to answer your question kind of aggressively, I guess, it depends on what you're trying to do, right? So I have used ChatGPT, for example, to conduct. So you can ask ChatGPT to build you a sales platform, right? So I, I literally did this the other day. I said, if I just relocated cities and I want X amount of clients within the next 12 months that meet this particular demographic, um, these are their general interests. Can you build me a sales funnel and can you build me a process for actually how to interact with them and get in front of them? Um, it's really helpful for doing a lot of the foundational work. The problem is as they like to always disclose it's, Oh, you know, their hallucinations and other issues with that. Um, one more importantly was that it completely got the math wrong. And it told me that it was going to generate tons and tons of cash. When you go look at the numbers <laughs> that it provided, it just, they're like, Man, you, you messed up. <laughs> um, but you can use it to gain I think some pretty valuable information for your target audience and your industry, major players and stuff like that. A lot of chat GBT at least um, will pull um, citations for you. So depending on what you're looking for, you can use it to drill down and get a lot of valuable information. Um, you can also use it 
for if you have a couple examples of let's say marketing verbiage that you like or other conversations you can feed it examples and train it and it will start to generate follow-ups for you so i said hey create me an email cadence that has eight steps um and i need each one to be unique but i'm targeting this type of individual and it will create them and but you have to at least do the legwork to understand if that's appropriate or not um, you then also have to adjust it for verbosity right like it loves to just write out five paragraphs when i said i want a concise introduction email and three paragraphs later it was like okay well that clearly isn't a cut and paste solution so <laughs> you can use it to do a lot of legwork. If you're trying to build a website that talks to your customer, you can use it to build the vast majority of the copy. Um, you can use it to pull some customer information, especially if it's public. Um, and you can ask it to compare and contrast solutions, um, but you do have to follow up behind it and validate that. Awesome. Yeah. It's I will cute. also disclose it is very obvious though when you get in front of somebody who so like if you tried to fill out this questionnaire, for example, with stuff from Chat GPT and you can't immediately answer when we have discussions around the questions, it becomes really obvious that you use Chat GPT. So it still doesn't, it's not going to replace the the hard work around knowing your customer though. It's definitely iterative. You, you cannot let it go one time. You're going to talk to the marketing against the grain guys. They talk about all this stuff and there's different purposes for different of the um, LLMs. Mm -hmm. Claude, for example, is very good at writing. Uh, notebook though is able to take in and go like find stuff on the internet whereas the others are not able to do that claude will often say i'm stupid and i can't go search on the internet but if you tell it to search in a specific time frame it can do that um you can upload Ooh, a ton of stuff yes yeah yeah you have to about mess it. with it <laughs> But then okay. you always have to say consolidate, like don't be like condense this because it's it's always verbose. Okay. Yeah. But it's fun to play with. It's it, but it is a rabbit hole. I mean, like, you know, if you're a founder, get to work. Yeah. I don't like to use chat GPT that much for marketing copy, but whenever I've hit a wall, sometimes I'll um I'll go to it for inspiration. And one thing that's really helped me is if you prompt it before you ask your original question, you say, hey, I'm going to ask you to write some copy for an email. Say, um, before you would give me that copy, I want you to ask me questions about my business that will help you better make this copy. And it gives you a list of 10, 20 questions about your business. You fill it out, you get much better results that way. Cool. That's why it's a rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well. All right, Garrett, thank you so much. If you send me your DD stuff that you did after you edit it, um, we will edit our video tonight to make it look pretty. And we will send out an email on uh, Friday at noon that has all of these links in it. All right, cool. I okay, so, so everybody, this is our last actual session with information. I will be here. Um, wait a minute. Am I right? Can somebody help me? Yeah, you're right. I'm right. Okay. So next week, though, what we have is office hours. So if you're having any questions about the application for Angel NV5, um, I'll be online to answer any of those questions. Um, the link was included in the email that went out today about tonight's session. And the link for the application will be included again on Friday. Um, so you guys can apply. Yes. 
Josh. Since this is the last informational session, and I promised that I'd do at least 10% of the work, and Garrett would do 90%, I have a single slide to present. Oh, please do. Does it have uh, anything to do with AI? Nothing. And nothing about sales. So <laughs> Okay. Let's have it. Perfect. All right. This is the single slide guide. So I have now been, uh, I've done due diligence now for Angel and V three times. I've been co-lead, lead, all that sort of stuff. So this is my single slide guide for all the founders going through this process. So first things first, if you're anything like me and you go to the Cheesecake Factory, the menu is huge and it can become overwhelming. And to me, it kind of like, it's just too much. And I feel like the DD questionnaire can be the same way. Uh, and how do you eat the elephant, right? The old saying, one bite at a time. So when I go to somewhere like Cheesecake Factory, I, what I do with the menu is I decide first what I do not want. And I try and find entire pages of the menu that I do not want. Um, and that helps me kind of take this huge sprawling thing and kind of condense it down. So I encourage you to kind of take that approach in terms of, okay, what should these sections maybe not are the most applicable to my business? Or what are the questions that are very quickly answered, not available or not applicable, that sort of thing. Uh, going through and doing a first pass through the DD doc uh, will help you kind of condense it. Secondly, communicate with your DD lead. Uh, this has been a real killer when the first you know week or so when the DD questionnaire comes out. Uh, we are relying on this document to inform much of our DD and to create the DD memo that we're going to create at the end of the 30 page you know, document we're going to share with all the other investors. So make sure that you communicate with us. If you're stuck, if it's going to take a little bit more time, be in contact. Radio silence is an absolute killer during this time. And it really reflects poorly on your business, no matter what your business is, right? Because we are looking to you to be responsive and reach out and, and all those sorts of things. So please, please, please stay in touch with your DD lead. You don't have to be talking to all the investors in your group. Make sure you're in touch with the DD lead. Uh, be thorough. Blank spaces leave us guessing and leave us to our own imagination. We don't want that. Um, <laughs> so make sure that everything is filled out. Even again, if it's not exactly applicable, put that. It's totally fine. Uh, own your weaknesses. Gaps and weaknesses are okay. In fact, they're expected in startups. But not having a plan to address them is not okay. So don't be concerned about maybe, you know, if, say, maybe you are possibly weak on sales or you need to improve your sales funnel or those sorts of things. You can address that in the DD document, but just be upfront about it, but have a plan to address whatever weaknesses or gaps you might have. A big one, because I've experienced this multiple times now, don't hide the ball during the due diligence portion. It is a real killer if you are misrepresenting information or seemingly sort of hiding something that the DD team can find rather easily. Um, I've seen this happen. I've seen kind of uh, grants misrepresented as revenue. I've seen a lot of different things that can kind of really jam up uh, the founder kind of investor due diligence relationship. And lastly, it's collaborative, not personal. Um, you'll probably face some tough questions and just the DD document itself is tough. It's huge, it's extensive. Um, tough questions are great opportunities to strengthen your business. And if you are, working with the right sort of investors and going through the right sort of diligence. These questions might seem tough at times, they might seem pointed at times, but really they might seem probing, they might seem annoying, you might get the same questions multiple times. These are just the investors trying to triangulate you know, and learn about your business. Take these as opportunities to strengthen what you've got going on, no matter what that might be. So you know, the investors are, especially during Angel NV, uh, maybe not so for other, uh, groups, but during the Angel NV process, it's a teaching and learning conference. So, you know, use this opportunity to learn and strengthen your business. So that's it. So Josh, that was really valuable. So true. And we can tell you that for every time that we've done Angel NV, which is four times now, uh, there are at least two companies that drop out of due diligence, and usually it's because they're not disclosing something. Mm -hmm. And if they're cagey about the questions that we ask, it goes poorly for them. If they're honest and there's a reasonable explanation, it's fine. And so we really only give you about a week, maybe two weeks to 
fill out the due diligence questionnaire, do the best that you can. And if there are gaps there, then you can explain why. Uh, one of the companies that was in line to actually receive an investment had a really weird looking um, cash flow. And so in the end, we discovered that this founder didn't know anything really about the business, was totally oblivious to accounting and was relying on other people for this information. And so in the end, instead of receiving an investment, somebody else did. So just be honest about what's going on. And if you need help, I mean, the good thing about Startup NV is that we have all sorts of mentors. They can help you to get this done. But yeah, Absolutely. it's 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 a rough process, but it's meant to be. Like people are putting their money and their faith in you. You have to be up to it. Yep. Any questions about the process that week, what it's like to work with the due diligence lead? Anything more broadly that I can help answer? I can't do any of the specific stuff. Not like Garrett <laughs> and, and all the other pros can. If you get Josh as a lead, you're lucky because he's got a great <laughs> sense of humor. Uh, he definitely does. Well, that's a fun time. <laughs> we have a fun time. <laughs> All right. Well, yes. I, it seems like I we're guess done. I'll see, everyone, I'll see everyone in Angel NV then. Yeah. That'll be January, guys. Fantastic. Cool. All right. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Josh. Thanks, Maggie. Thanks, Josh.